in 2015, WordPress made a decision on behalf of the web. It was a significant one, although at the time it didn't really look like it. Uh, it was the inclusion of responsive images into WordPress core. The reason why it was significant was because in 2015, the jury was still out on responsive images. There was a spec, there were a huge group of people working on that spec, and some of those people said, if we're gonna win this battle over what the spec should look like, we should just ship our code to as many people as possible, and then the web will just follow. And some of those people looked to WordPress and said, there's already work being done there, so we're just gonna come into the project and help out. Package it up, put it into WordPress core, and ship it to 20-something like percent of the web. And then hopefully, that will be enough. This is a slide from uh, Joe McGill's talk about this from 2015. Um, unfortunately, this stat no longer exists. It's a weird thing on the web. It's like, all these companies make stats about how the web works, but then they change their algorithms all the time. So you'll be like, whoa, look at this graph. It looks crazy. And then six months later, you look at the same graph, and it looks completely different. And then the explanation is in the annotation going like, we changed the uh, mathematical formula to calculate this, and we omitted the following data. So we're, we're just going to choose to believe Joe's <laughs> <laughs> Joe's screenshot, because that's how the web works now. Anything that's a screenshot is <laughs> real and happened. Um, but th this is actually real. And until WordPress, uh, was it 4.4 shipped, responsive images was not something that was prevalent on the web. Uh, when WordPress 4.4 shipped, responsive images was suddenly a thing that was happening on the web in a very specific way to the point where Joe's told me that now when you go and look at uh, tutorials on how to do responsive images, you'll find little snippets of code that actually originate from WordPress. We have not been the best custodians of our decision, though. On Thursday this week, WordPress shipped code that doesn't comply with responsive images anymore to every WordPress user in the world. And this wasn't something that we didn't know. Um, this was flagged in April 2017. And it kind of tells us something about how we make decisions in this community. We all want to do great things. We are in this room, we are in this community, we build WordPress together, specifically because we want to make the web a place everyone can be at. But because of how WordPress came about, because of how open source works, because of everything else, the way we make decisions on individual items is often strange. And when you dive deep into it and invest time in it, you can often get rather confused about what is happening and how it's happening. Um, and it's funny because if you've been following me on Twitter, it's like 90% garbage, <laughs> but occasionally I'll say something that I think is meaningful and then other people will be like, hey, yeah, I disagree with you and I'm gonna have a conversation with you on this forum because that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so I had this huge thing going where I was saying, hey, we really need to fix this problem and it's this really technical small little problem that no one can see, but it's a problem that we need to fix because we are custodians of a decision that we made on behalf of the web. And in the middle of that conversation, this guy called Matt. Are you here? Is he? He's watching somewhere else. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a joke. I appreciate it. He'll probably hear about this at some point. But you know, it's public, so it's on the internet. So Matt came in and said, not sure if responsive images should have ever come into core. I think I agree with Matt, but I don't think I agree with the reason. You see, responsive images, when it was included in Core, the decision was made because it was a new, cool technology. And it was something that looked like we needed. 
Unfortunately, the spec was really not ready for the future. So what worked in 2015 doesn't work properly anymore. But we shipped it, and it became a standard because of it. I want to talk to you about how we can use WordPress to move the web forward. So we keep talking about this number, right? The ever-increasing incremental, probably wrong because the stat probably updated this morning, um, number of like 26%, 25%, no, 27%. <laughs> 32%, 32.5%, that was Thursday. So I guess it's probably 32.56 or something like that today. This is the footprint that the software we create has on the web. Well, to be frank, it's like, what is it, the top 10 million sites on, according to Alexa or something like that, but it's a significant footprint on the web. And we keep talking about where are we gonna go next? Well, the goal is, 50% apparently, uh, and the goal is to like, really make the web powered by WordPress in some fashion. Last year, Matt Mullenweg said, what got us here won't get us to 50%. That's true, but it's true in a bigger sense than just you know, code and how we do things. It's actually true in the way we manage our community. What got us to this point was deep devotion to open source software and a community that piles together to solve huge problems in a very interesting way that works really well and a lot of luck. What gets us to the next hurdle will be how we manage ourselves. You see, the web evolves by cave Caving, paving the cow paths. Some of you may have seen this picture before. It's a story I tell a lot because I think it's funny. <laughs> this is our uh, head office at LinkedIn Learning. They built a new building because we were expanding. And the designer of the head office had this grand idea that there's a building and then there's the new office directly in front of it. And they built this huge oval of grass in front of the main entrance and then had a path that went around it. And it looks really nice. And we, they opened the building the day I was there. And I, <laughs> I walked through and I'm like, this is stupid, so I'm just gonna walk right over the grass. Uh, and it was this high, really tall grass. So when you walked over it, you kind of pounded it down. So I started walking over it and then other people walked over it and eventually uh, it became a bit of an issue. <laughs> so, they paved it. <laughs> this is how the web works. Someone proposes a spec or some sort of new technology, a bunch of people use it. Then a bunch more people see that they use it, so they use it too. And eventually the browser manufacturers see, say, this is a cow path that's been paved, the, the, that people have been using, so we're gonna pave that cow path. The idea is, Instead of coming up with a new and better spec, they look at the current behavior of the people who are creating things on the web, and then they say, we're gonna formalize this behavior into a standard, and we're gonna make it so that that's how it works. With 32% of the web, we are actually the cow path now. Whatever decision we make for WordPress is a decision we make on behalf of the web. So how do we make these decisions? And how do we know that those decisions are the right decisions for the web, not just WordPress? What principles do we stand for and refer to any time we say, this is something not only WordPress, but the web should do? Well, we have a principle. In our about page, it says, we believe in democratizing publishing and the freedom that comes with open source. Uh, the spelling error is likely me, not the about page, by the way. What does that mean? Democratize publishing. It sounds great, but what does it actually mean? I like to break down words and figure out what they actually mean. So democratize 
means introduce a democratic system or governance principles or democratic principles, or make something accessible to everyone. So that last one seems really reasonable, right? And publishing means make content available online or in paper or whatever, but online. So if we take those two pieces together, we get this really awkward sentence. Democratized publishing means make making content available online accessible to everyone. This is what we believe. This is our principle and it has been since day one. This is democratizing publishing on the web. Now if we take a step back and look at the larger web and what the larger web's principles are, we find the web foundation founded by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. And the web foundation says, we envision a world where all people are empowered by the web Everyone, regardless of language, ability, location, gender, age, or income, will be able to communicate and collaborate, create valued content, and access the information that they need to improve their lives and communities. And you read it and you go, that sounds like WordPress. And it truly does. Because if you take that and then you combine it with our values that say WordPress is software designed for everyone, emphasizing accessibility, performance, security, and ease of use. And we believe great software should work with minimum setup, and you can focus on sharing your story, product, or services freely. What you realize is WordPress, in a really real sense, can be the realization of the promise of the web. The promise of the web is that everyone should have equal access to content and content publishing, to be able to share their thoughts, ideas, and creations with the world and talk to anyone else about those thoughts, ideas, and creations. And WordPress makes that possible. It costs nothing, it runs almost everywhere, and it just works. What's missing from us is maybe the most crucial part for the web, which is participation and representation in the fora that make decisions about the space we work in. Who speaks for WordPress? When politicians make decisions about the internet, they introduce privacy laws, they introduce encryption laws, they ban encryption or add more encryption, they ban privacy or add more privacy. Who speaks for WordPress in those fora? The answer is corporations with financial interest in specific outcomes. The answer is corporations with specific interests that are an antithesis to what we want. The answer is everyone else speaks on behalf of us and we say nothing. Who speaks for the people who use WordPress? No one. We power 32.5% of the web, and when a decision is made and people want to know what WordPress stands for, there's no answer. We have made a conscious decision to not take part in any decision that impacts every user of our software. And many of those decisions are now coming into our software and saying, hey, you didn't take part in this decision, but you now have to change your software to fit with our demands. We are at the point where we need to claim our seat at every table where a decision is made. Because we have an obligation to actually represent the people affected by WordPress. And the people affected by WordPress is not just the 99% who are not here today. It is actually every user of the web. Because when we make decisions on WordPress, we are making decisions on behalf of the web. But to do that, we must first know what we stand for. Now, like I said, democratized publishing, that's what we stand for, right? But what are the necessary conditions for us to be able to democratize publishing? That's a question we need to answer. Because when we go in and we talk to all the people that make decisions, we need to figure out 
What is it we want to ask them? Where are the principles that we are going to stand on when we argue with them over how they govern the web, how they govern the internet, how they govern communication that goes through optical cables under oceans and into the sky and up in space? We need to know what those principles are. I have a proposal on how to get started. So if you think about the web and think about our role on the web, what you see is there are three governing principles that are essential for WordPress and its users. The first one is accessibility. Now, accessibility is the promise of the web. The entire reason the web exists is for anyone to plug into a phone line or a network line and be able to access content that other people have published in the way that they want and in the way that works for them. The grand idea of the web was simply to take all the documents that were sitting in books and folders at CERN and make them available to people on the other side of the planet in a way that they could access it and contribute back to it. That is the extension that we've created. We've made that possible to everyone. Accessibility is the core promise of the web. Privacy is the capability we must grant our users. Now, WordPress meets one of the great promises of the web, which is anyone can publish content. And we take great strides to protect the publisher. We also have to give the publisher the capability of protecting their users. The privacy of the end user of the web is our responsibility. And finally, open governance for the web, for the internet. We need to take part in the conversations about how the web is run, how the web works, and we need to take part in the conversations about how the internet runs, how it works, and how information flows across all nations on the entire globe and in the universe. Because there's like a spaceship up there with people on it, and they have internet. And I guarantee you one of them has a WordPress site. <laughs> I'm going to do something I'm not supposed to. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you about accessibility and privacy and open governance. I want the people who do this work to talk to you about accessibility and privacy and governance. So Rachel, can you come up and talk about accessibility for me? Excuse me. Good morning. So some of you know me as the director of WP Campus. Some of you know me as the woman who says Roll Tide a lot on the internet. <laughs> Roll Tide. And uh, hopefully most of you know me as someone who cares a lot and talks a lot about accessibility. And I, Morton's right. This microphone is awkward. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to lean here and have a little moment. So I wanted to stand up here and talk to you for just a few minutes about this topic and have a little bit of a heart to heart. Like, we're going to just talk one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Because accessibility has been a little bit of a hot word in our community lately, and people are very passionate all around, and for good reasons. So I think if we chat a little bit about why that is and how we can move forward, I think that would be super great. So accessibility is something that, for a lot of us who build the web, can be quite frustrating, and I get it. It's tough for someone to come along and say, I can't use your website, and it's your fault. That's hard, right? But there's not one person in this room that can stand up on this stage and say that I have built 100% accessible websites that every single person on the web can use. And the more that we can come to terms with that and kind of let go of that ego, I promise the easier it is. Because <laughs> it's not about us, right? It's, not, it's about the user. It's not about you know, how we feel about it. It's about growing and making the web better, and making the web more usable, and making the web usable for those 20 plus percent of people that depend on assistive technologies to even consume information. For those like myself who are able-bodied and can use a mouse, and have vision, and can hear, navigating the web is really easy. You do not think about you know, these problems that come along. It is super easy for us. We have a level of privilege that we can forget about. But for those who maybe can't use a mouse and can't see and can't hear, it's a very different, very real experience and a very real challenge. 
And so a lot of accessibility discussions can be frustrating, especially I'm an engineer, and you have someone come along, and I'm going to be real for a second. A lot of accessibility problems are due to invalid HTML. Like you are building, we're building the web wrong. And it's not, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. We all learned from Googling Stack Overflow and copying and pasting tutorials, and that's how we got here, you know? And so we've all done it. Um, and so, but that's what it comes down to. A lot of times we're using, we're not using semantic HTML. We're using span tags instead of buttons to, you know, throw things up. You know, JavaScript came along and gave us this huge opportunity to manipulate the DOM in very dynamic ways. But if you don't truly understand HTML, then you're more likely to uh, basically mess up the DOM. You're, you're kind of moving HTML around a lot. You're confusing the browser. <laughs> and I get it. Like, it's fun. JavaScript is fun. And a lot of times, um, myself included, you know, you're working on something, and your website works, and you're maybe not necessarily thinking if it's working correctly. And so I think for a lot of us in our community moving forward, you know, like what we need a lot in our community is some kind of enforcement and some kind of scanning and things like this, like the more we can implement tools. There are a lot of tools available. I hope you'll join me tomorrow at the Contributor Day. We're going to work on ways to enforce scanning in core, which will be really great. And I know that when something comes along, some code you wrote gets scanned and returns a violation that's hard to see. Um, but I promise it's going to make you better as a developer because you're learning, and it's going to make the experience better for the users. But I think that we should take it a step further because, you know, core is only part of the fun. You know, we're all writing themes and we're all writing plugins that everyone uses, and that's a huge percentage of how people interact with WordPress. So we do have a personal responsibility to come along and use these same tools to understand HTML and use it correctly, to understand ARIA, I'd recommend watching Rianne's talk from yesterday, which is a great uh, HTML spec. So we have a responsibility there to come along and understand these things, to scan our own things. I would love to see a world in WordPress going forward where themes and plugins aren't allowed in the repo unless they meet a certain level of accessibility. That's what I propose here today that we start to work on because we do have a responsibility. We do have this repo that everyone's coming along and downloading all this code, you know, but we're not coming along behind ourselves and making sure that what we're putting out there not only works, but is accessible. And that's something that we, sh that we should take on. So I do think these are things that we can do. They may seem like a little bit of a challenge here at the front, but we can do this if we work together. And we can take on this uh, project and responsibility, and we can, as a whole, impact 32.5% of the web, and that's really great and amazing. Um, so I hope that you'll work with me. I hope y'all would come and join tomorrow. Um, and thank you for this opportunity, Morton. We're passing it along. Oh, I am not the last in this scenario, by the way. And so I would love to bring up Leo to come and talk about privacy. Hey everyone, uh, not like 15, 16 hours ago I was on the stage talking about privacy. So some of you may, might have seen me talk just a little while ago about the exact same topic. Um, privacy is a big deal. Like I don't know here how many people have done work surrounding GDPR, surrounding uh, span cam, around all the laws and stuff. And people usually say, man, it really sucks having to follow the law. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but the laws exist because we need to care about people. So. At a, at a really basic level, I think people take issues surrounding privacy and say, we want to understand how to make money, or we want to understand how to make our businesses sustainable. We want to understand what's critical at the end of the day to get us from where we are to where we want to go. And uh, I think first about publishing at a core idea. So I went to journalism school. Um, I had this dream when I was in high school, I was going to be like, at the New York Times, writing in this newspaper, or maybe at this big magazine, and I did a lot of that stuff. I did journalism, and I saw that whole thing happen. I remember Craigslist. You guys all know Craigslist. Uh, we all saw the death of the newspaper, and we're watching it as we speak. Um, newspapers won't exist five, ten years from now, or if they do, they'll be a hollowed-out shell of themselves. 
Uh, and it's a weird thing. So what replaces that model instead? It's things like analytics. It's things like advertising. These are the core things that make the internet possible. They, they actually make it so that these businesses are sustainable. There are also things like paywalls, right? Paywalls are really interesting. They make it so that people are saying this content is worth paying for. At the end of the day, when we start to build in these whole things, we start to think about then better content and better structures around it. We have SEO as a whole business. There are a lot of really critical people in this space who are like, yeah, we have the very best content. We also have a little bit of code that runs here that personalizes the ads and that suddenly this data here is gonna be really good. Well, the challenge is there are a lot of frameworks surrounding all this stuff that say it should be a certain way. Most of us in this room are not familiar with those frameworks. Most of us have not decided what those frameworks should be. Uh, at a really basic level, we have just accepted for a very, very long time that the way the internet looks is going to be uh, essentially something that we just have to comply with. In practice, people have broken those rules. So I'm sure you guys all know about what happened, uh, guys, girls, and non-gendered peoples, all know what happened uh, last year, two years ago. Um, 2016, there was a major discussion around data that was used as part of Facebook's data collection, as part of Cambridge Analytica, and all this stuff. I'm not gonna rant about Facebook. If you wanna see that, go look on YouTube or on WordPress.tv where I talk about that. But that data, including my data, was used to manipulate elections all across the world data that I did not give up, that was probably using psychographic profiling, which is part of marketing. It's been around for the last 50, 60 years. This is not a secret. People use data in ways to do whatever they want. In practice, we need to do two or three things as a community. We need to understand what data means. We need to understand how to use this data. We need to understand what the scope of that data means. And we should be asking questions about basic anonymization. Um, I get into some of the more technical nuances. Chances are, 60, 70% of the things we already do as a community are getting us in the right directions towards security and privacy. Um, I'm happy about that. We fundamentally in America do not understand the overlap between free speech and good user privacy. Um, if I go to the library, no one's gonna ask me what books I'm reading. If I go read an article online, I should not have the same level of, of introspection. People don't necessarily need to know that I really wanna read a book about how to sew, right? Maybe I just want to learn how to sew. Maybe I have a button that fell off my shirt. It doesn't suddenly mean that I'm now interested in sewing classes, right? This is a key critical concept that's been built into our infrastructure. Privacy is not necessarily something that's been coupled into the guarantee of information as accessibility. Um, and I've been really excited because as I see the space slowly shift, we now have laws that say you have to do this. The laws aren't the fun part. It's the privacy by design is the discussion. Uh, and there's nothing more exciting than to finally have an opportunity to be able to discuss this as a community. Uh, and I really hope that all of you have, if you have any thoughts around this, we have lots of docs that need to get written, we have lots of code that needs to get written, we have unit tests that need to get fixed, we have components that half work, but are, that shipped anyway, because that's how these things work. And we need your help to be able to move the nudge, nudge, nudge this little ball forward. Um, and as these laws change, we need your help to continuously help us understand where we've come from and where we wanna go. Oh, uh, next, we have someone else too. Oh, Chris Tizel. Hey, Chris. All right, so I get the fun topic of governance. Um, and like Leo said, um, laws aren't fun. Nobody likes to follow them, right? Um, and we get a lot of laws given to us, GDPR. We all had a lot of fun updating our websites. Now we all have to accept cookies and we get to have full screen pop-ups and everything come at us um, every time we visit a website. And I was inspired um, at a state of the word a couple years back, um, listening to Morton uh, talk about where is our representation to the people who are making the decisions and the laws about us? And there wasn't a real clear answer to that. Um, it was get involved. And I'll admit, I'm, I'm coming from a community that, that isn't WordPress. Um, my history is in Drupal. Yes, I'm one of those people. Um, and, um, and I'm here, and I'm, I'm converting, and I'm learning the ways. Um, and, I, and I know that for a while, I won't be able to use this I'm a newcomer tag. Um, but I do for now. Um, and so coming from Drupal and, and coming over, um, I was sitting there watching that, and I was, and I was thinking about it. And Heather uh, Burns who's uh, not here with us today, but hi, Heather, on the, the live stream. Uh, I contacted her at WordCamp Europe this year, and I said, hey, I work a lot in Drupal. 
I would love to work with you to figure out how we can together make privacy better for both of our projects. Um, then I got sucked into this whirlwind of um, <laughs> let's expand that and let's make that something bigger than just privacy. And so we're, we're working on it. We're getting other groups, other CMSs involved. And what we're trying to do is build an open web governance that will allow us as a group, not WordPress, um, but as a group dictate to those that are governing us, here's what we stand for and allow us to set those regulations ourselves. Because the problem is, is that right now we're reactionary. We are, we react to a new law that comes out. CCPA comes out from California and now we're all reacting to that. There's gonna be privacy laws, there's gonna be a GDPR clone for the US and we're gonna have to react to that. But can we get actionary? Can we become the ones that get out there and say, this is what we're already doing. We're creating the cow path. And my, my theory is that the lawmakers will follow. They're, they're, they're writing the rules that they are because they're not informed by the people who are writing the code. And so we need to be the ones informing them and giving them um, the insight to allow them to make laws that we can comply with and that we don't want to subvert at every corner that we, we take. Um, and so that's, that's my challenge. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm coming here from outside the community, from inside the community now for, for a year or two, um, saying, join us, join me, and let's figure out a way that we can um, provide a larger governance to the web and then voice that to the, the bodies that are regulating us so that we don't have to be reactionary anymore. So with that, I'll uh, bring Morton back up. Two days ago, WordPress made a very big decision on behalf of the web about how publishing should be done in the future. It is a bold decision that will be followed by every single person who publishes anything on the web. If you go outside the WordPress bubble right now onto the internet, you can see people go, what is this thing? And then you get the response, wait a second, we already did this eight years ago in our CMS that is internal to our company and has a proprietary license of $10,000 a month. And you have a bunch of other people who say, this is the thing that I always wanted, I just didn't know it. And then you have a bunch of people who are saying, what does this future look like? I can't answer that. I stood up on the stage here last year and I talked about my crank crazy vision of VR WordPress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and some people have started working on it. Um, hopefully tonight or in a couple hours, uh, our good friend Matt will tell us his vision of what the future looks like, not just for WordPress, but for the web. That includes thinking broader. If you ask me, this is the last time we should be making decisions for WordPress. From now on, every decision we make should be a decision we make not just for us, but for the web as a whole. What we discovered with responsive images was Gutenberg drew a line and said, this is the actual end of what responsive images can do. We found the edge. It is so close to the edge that it's hard to solve. The spec simply doesn't meet the requirements of the modern web. It was built for a time that doesn't exist anymore. When we go into a media project next year and say we're going to rethink media, we have to rethink media for the web. That means stepping outside the WordPress community and going to the W3C and going to the RICG and going to the CSS working group and to all the people who actually build the web and say, hey, we are 32% of the web. We want a seat at the table, not because we want to dictate how things are gonna be, but because we want to work together to build a solution that works for everyone so we can democratize publishing. And we can ship that solution to the web so we don't have to wait five years for it to take effect. We can make a decision, bake it into core, ship it, and with the turn of a switch, we change the web into what we want. Because we are 32% of the web. But to get there, we first need to understand where we want to go. 
That is our biggest challenge. The most difficult thing in life is to know yourself. It is also the most important challenge you have to undertake. What got us here won't get us there. Welcome to the first meeting of the WordPress Governance Project. The floor is open. If anybody has any questions, please come up to the microphones on either side of the room right here. Or if you have accessibility issues, I can bring the mic to you. This is made for a taller person. OK. <laughs> hey, Morton. Uh, so this seems like a great initiative. Uh, I've heard a few people murmuring about it in, in the last few days. Uh, how do we ensure that the current decision makers hear us and understand us and implement what we want in this project? Uh, I believe the answer was just do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go next? So my name is Linda Sherman, and I created a um, blog post on boomertechtalk.com called Website Design for Seniors. And um, I am, I really worked hard to collect websites that are accessible. It was really, really hard. There's, you, you go to, um, uh, Jamal Tashan, who's one of the people who talks about accessibility, it's very hard to find examples. So if anybody here has a website they want to brag about, would you please tell me so that I can put it on my website as an example. I'm collecting factoids and all kinds of things, and we tried to build something, miracleofthesea.com, to be like that. But um, please. So it's, it's, Twitter is at Linda Sherman, or get me at boomertechtalk.com. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Morton. I'm David Wolfhoff. I have a question about governance. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you know WordPress hadn't been making any decisions in the past. We've chosen to stay out of the decision-making process because no one speaks for WordPress. So if there was a governance project, um, it, 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 what is your thought if somebody decides, oh, you're making a government's decision that uh, I don't agree with, and I would just say, you don't speak for me because you know, I use a software, I'm not part of this decision-making process. Um, I guess what it means basically, if someone is making a decision on behalf of WordPress, doesn't that mean they're making a decision on behalf of 32.5% of the web? That's the challenge. So this is one of those things where, if you think about it, lack of participation is a choice. Right? It's the whole thing about if you don't vote in an election, you're actively vote, not voting in an election. The biggest challenge that we face now is that we need to figure out how to do this. The good news is there are other people who've already started tackling this challenge. The Node project has a governance process that they've walked, it took them years to walk through and they actually got somewhere with it. The Drupal project is currently working on a governance project to try to figure out how to manage the Drupal community. The AMP project just announced their governance setup. So there are models in place. What we need to do is figure out what do those models look like for us. We need to define what is governance for WordPress. We need to define what does that mean? What are the powers? What are the rights and privileges that are granted to people who are decision makers? How do we choose those people? What do they do? Who do they represent and in what circumstances and how do they push that representation forward? Because the reality is when we don't do anything, the politician can go and say, hey, hello, like if Drupal shows up and goes to a politician and says, hey, we want to, we, we disagree with your decision. The politician comes back and says, you percent, what, 2% of the web? The 32% aren't here. So we're not gonna listen to you because the majority 
isn't speaking. So we're just going to assume they're okay with whatever we do. So we need to figure that out. That's why we need to have these conversations. I'm not an audience plant, but I like that you had slides ready to go for my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, this will be our last question. Go ahead. Hi, Morton. You might have just answered this, but I noticed in the de definition of democratizing, there was the idea of bringing democratic principles to something. So I wondered if you're suggesting that we actually elect leadership to represent the whole. I think that is probably the toughest part of this process. Personally, and I say this as a former politician, <laughs> I don't think that that would work. <laughs> I think we need to look at a different kind of governance model. We might actually have to come up with a new type of governance model, but we cannot do that in a vacuum because every decision we make is a decision we make on behalf of the web. So. When we think about governance, we need to look at what everyone else is doing. We need to talk to everyone else and say, hey, how do we do this thing? And how do we do it in such a way that it lasts so that we get to whatever it is we want to get to? We need to define where we want to go, but before we can do that, we need to define how we define that. This is, this is the important work, and it has to happen now. That's not a really good answer, but it's all I have. So since that was the last question, if you are interested in this, uh, we put up a little Google form to, uh, to capture your email so that we can, you can get notified about when we organize our first meeting. I invite you all to come. Uh, the Google form meets GDPR compliance standards and things. <laughs> <laughs> we promise not to send advertisements. We will only use it to send you an alert about when the first meeting is. And, uh, Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. And forward WordPress.